Rhonda, we are uh, real happy that you're with us this morning. Tell us about your work. What are you doing these days? I've been trying to balance the work I've been doing inside myself with the work I've been doing in service to the community. I've been uh, learning how to be, as Christ said, in the world but not of the world and to be fully in the world so that part of the thing, some of the things I'm doing are taking care of my father who is very old and frail, uh, working with AIDS patients, working with the Seva Foundation, lecturing on uh, Dharma, on spiritual practices, uh, writing. Um, I think that's about what I've been doing. Tell us about your involvement with the Seva Foundation. And what does Seva mean? What is that concept? Seva is a Sanskrit word which means service. And it's a group of people who got together to see if they could do, who really liked doing service to try to help relieve suffering in the world. And they wanted to see if they could do it in a way that would be fun to do. And uh, Seva is backed by as disparate groups as the Grateful Dead, which is a rock band, and the United Way, which is not a rock band. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's a very um, interesting organization because it's made up of such a disparate group of people, all the way from um, people from the Center for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, doctors, etc., as well as... Uh, people like Wavy Gravy the Clown from the hog farm of the 60s, plus people like me uh, who are spiritual. It was started by a fellow named Dr. Larry Brilliant, and these are all friends from different parts of his life. And um, our project started out being primarily health-related with blindness in Nepal, working with blindness in Nepal and India, mainly doing cataract surgery. Uh, there are 100,000 people blind in Nepal for want of an operation that takes four minutes and it costs $15. And when you think about it, when you meet somebody in there, when I go to Nepal, I meet somebody that's blind in a place where you're out of the labor force and the family can't support you. Some of these people are waiting years for an operation that takes four minutes and costs $15. And they just don't have the technological sophistication and the wherewithal to put the act together to get that done. This, so we're helping that process. We've also been working with uh, Guatemalan refugees and with Guatemalan villagers, with American Indians for health problems in the Dakotas, and with some reforestation programs in South Africa, South America, etc. The projects we get into are directed by our hearts. And we do it on a heart-to-heart -heart basis. That is, we back people doing projects. We don't back projects. Back people who we love and trust and who we feel have a quality of compassion that's very mature. And then those people we back, and then they go do what they need to do. That's the kind of thing we've been doing. Everyone gets something out of what they do. What do you get out of this type of work? What's the payoff for you? Well, there are a lot of levels of payoff for doing this kind of work. One is that you, um, you, um, it's like I feed my heart. It's as if it's like taking vitamins for the heart. It's, I get the sense of uh, I am a richer human being for the fact that I am part of the chain that relieves suffering in the world. There's a way in which it releases me from the kind of paranoia of them. I've got to keep them away for me to be. I am learning how to be happy or keep my heart open in hell in a way, to be happy embracing the suffering of other people rather than pushing the suffering away. That's part of it. Part of it is that I get incredibly um, high from working with um, uh, my friends in Seva. That we're learning how to help each other get very straight and very truthful. And uh, to have friends that you trust to be straight with you, to help you keep clear, 
we have an organization at the moment that has it as, as its core living truth. And the problem is that the half-life of any organization is very short for living truth before it turns into some kind of very uh, successful and very righteous and very good organization, but it doesn't have that living spirit in it. And we keep cherishing that and having to re-consecrate it, rededicate it. And it's really hard work and it's fun. It's fun. It's a great experiment in life. In your lecture series, you hand out little booklets called The Save a Story. In it, you list 10 of the major components of the goals for the Save a Foundation. What I would like to do is ask you about each of these individual components and have you comment on them. The first is helping the idealism of the 60s and the self-examination of the 70s find integrated expression in the 80s in responsible action, which helps to relieve suffering wherever possible. The, uh, <clears throat> there was such an incredible sense of excitement and idealism in the 60s, of that it was all possible again, and that really we could uh, have peace in the world, that we could have... Uh, a relief of suffering, that there would be a closing of the gap between the haves and the have-nots. There was a dream. The Peace Corps came out of that. There was a lot of things that came out of that. Uh, the anti-Vietnam movement came out of that. The, it, it had a certain naivete and a certain sweetness about it, but it also wasn't fully pure. And in the 70s, I think people got... Um, uh, a little cynical, they got closed down a little bit. Also, that group of people grew up, they had babies, they had to have uh, insurance and homes and jobs, and instead of setting up alternative culture, they started to work with the existing culture or establishment and find their way in it and use their consciousness to, to solve their own problems within it. And also working on themselves inwardly, then comes the 80s in which there is a lot of uncertainty and a kind of a chaotic world in terms of the bomb proliferations, the terrorism, economic instability, uh, uh, ecological, uh, profound questions about ecological dangers in the world, um, a greater polarization of the haves and the have-nots. And it's in these conditions now that there is the possibility that the idealism of the 60s and that kind of inner work that was done in the 70s can find some expression because that didn't go away. It's all inside people. And what I'm blown away by is how many people who are what are called yuppies often are saying, how can we help? What can we do? Because that idealism inside themselves is not being fed by the way in which they... Um, they live their lives. The second goal you list for the SEVA Foundation is creating an opportunity to grow spiritually and consciously through collaboratively cultivating the compassion of our own heart. Uh, if you just serve other people in order to relieve their suffering and you're attached to the end of their suffering, sooner or later you burn out. And the only way that I understand that you can develop what I understand as mature compassion is to free yourself from, this is hard to say, free yourself from the attachment to the end of suffering and yet work to end suffering. It's what the Bhagavad Gita, one of the beautiful ancient texts of Hinduism describes, and it says, be not identified with being the actor and be not, be, be not attached to the fruits of the action. Now, when you can imagine being free of those two things and still doing the service, and you do it because it's your part to play in the dance, and yet what effect it has is in God's hands. And the, the less you identify with being the doer, it's like you drive a car, and the car is driving, but you're often busy thinking about other things. You're not even busy being the driver of the car at the moment. You're not identified with being the actor, although the action's happening. 
And there is a way to do service that way, since we all have a lot to learn into how to do service that way, which is doing it dharmically, it's called, and doing it as dharma. The way we do service until we appear enough is as work on ourselves to become free of the attachments of mind to the way we're doing service. As we do that more and more, as we break that, those sets, we become more pure instruments of service to other people. And so we're using our work in Seva to work on ourselves, working on ourselves to be a more pure instrument for service to other people. It's something reflected in Mother Teresa's work a lot. That's exactly the way she approaches the work. The third point that you mentioned is acknowledging the earth and the family that dwells thereon as our home and family. There are ways of looking at the universe. They can be called planes of consciousness, altered states, whatever you want to, however you want to define them, where you look at other people and you see through the veils of their separateness. It's as if you see through the individual differences that are made up of their bodies, their personalities, even their astrology. And you look in and you just see as if you're looking into the eyes of another person like you're seeing another soul. Like if you and I meet, we meet as fellow souls on earth, learning what we're doing on earth, learning how to do it beautifully and grow from that experience. And when you see other people that way, you're beginning to see the family of the spirit. You're seeing fellow awarenesses, if you will. And when you stand back, you see that the earth itself, the Gaia, the mother, is one whole consciousness itself, is another entity, and made up of many other entities, and just as we are made up of many other entities, and those entities are made up of many other entities. I mean, the extraordinary quality of the universe, the awesome nature of the lawful relation of macro and micro and uh, the holography of the whole scene is just uh, mind-blowing to look at. And um, to see that it's all family and that we are connected to each other means that your actions no longer come out of what's in it for me. It's much more of uh, what Gandhi said when you surrender completely to God or to this higher seeing of the universe, you find yourself in the service of all that exists. It becomes your delight and recreation. I like that one. The fourth goal is particularly poignant. The belief that many of the problems facing humanity, hunger, poverty, unnecessary morbidity, and mortality and the fear of violence can be reduced through dedicated human effort. Uh, Seva grew out of a group of people who were involved in the Southeast Asia component of the worldwide smallpox eradication program. Smallpox is the only human disease that has been completely eradicated from the face of the earth. Since it's only passed from humans to humans and since no human has it anymore, it's gone. And this was done through an incredible dedicated effort of human beings who understood that they were in a sense doing the work of the spirit to do this and collaborating to do this from people from Russia, Switzerland, England, Germany, United States, Japan, on and on, people from all around the world getting together to do this. This disease that was a real, it killed people, it maimed them, it blinded them. It was a very, very fierce disease. We were all, many of us were vaccinated in order to avoid smallpox. That's all gone now. You don't have to do any of that anymore. So there is proof that people collaboratively, and it was out of that group's excitement and enthusiasm about doing that kind of service that they then formed SEVA to do more things like that. So we have a, a track record of the possibility that that can be done in the world. Yeah. In this age of incredible competition, this next point rings home. Helping people to help themselves. It's very interesting how you help another human being. You can help them in such a way 
that even though you put food in their belly or you make their health better, you impoverish them psychologically. You can make them feel more helpless. If you're busy milking the helping act for your own need for righteousness, for doing good, on the other hand, if you see yourself merely as part of a process in the universe in which you do your part and they do their part, and you see that from helping acts you get helped yourself, and that really a relation between a helper and a helped is between two beings of consciousness meeting and recognizing one another and then doing what they do together. There are ways to empower people you help rather than to impoverish them. And you empower them by recognizing the living spirit in each of them and seeing that they are peers and that they are all peers before God. We are all children before God. And we're, we're all poor before God. There's no rich and poor. And even sickness and health is all relative. And we're all dying. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's all like who's helping whom. I mean, I'm finding it tremendously that I am helped immeasurably be, by the people I help. The sixth goal of the Seva Foundation is valuing a rapprochement in conscious action between the activists and the spiritual seekers, the doers and the beers. We found in Seva that um, at the beginning, we really polarized as a group into the doers who had a tremendous track record of uh, achievement of going into Southeast Asia and getting rid of smallpox with jeeps and vaccination needles and charts and maps. And, and they were just looking for more things to do to get rid of suffering. The quality of their doing, however, often made the means create another kind of suffering in themselves and the rest of the world, even though their ends were beautiful. There are others in the group that were beers who said, the quality of the being, they said what Gandhi said when Gandhi was pulling out of a railway station and a reporter rushed up and said, Mahatma Ji, give me a message to take back to the people. And he just had time to scribble on a piece of paper, a bag, and he handed it out and said, my life is my message. And what the beers say is that the means and the ends are of a piece and that how you do an action is as important as that you do it and that you sometimes have to slow down a little bit so that it's done in a way that is fully conscious as you do it. And we've had this struggle, and it's a beautiful struggle because some of us beers don't do enough, and some of us doers don't cultivate our own being enough. So we really need each other to keep straight. That's part of what the fun of the 80s is, is we're finally to that dot doers and beers, and it's polarizing and all going in different directions. The seventh goal addresses compassion. Appreciating the wisdom of Gandhi's statement, what you do may seem in insignificant, but it is very important that you do it. There is such an ocean of suffering in the world. I mean, there's also pleasure and beauty and fun and play, but there is an ocean of suffering. There is suffering of every conceivable kind, and often, middle-class people live in ghettos where they isolate themselves from the suffering of others. But the, just the way in which they do that, if you look in their faces, you see there is suffering in them in the way they do it. So what I experience often is that the ocean of suffering is so vast and the media bring it so immediately to you and you, the faces of the people around you and the stories about other cultures it's so intense that what often happens is you feel powerless before this ocean, this wave, this like tidal wave of suffering. And um, the Edmund Burke's line is, uh, the worst mistake is to do nothing because you can only do a little, which is the same line as Gandhi's, what you do may seem insignificant, but it's very important that you do it. That... Um, since everything is interrelated, if you do an act of suffering, if you help somebody across the street or pick up somebody's groceries or read to somebody that's blind or, or just be kind and tender to somebody that has AIDS or whatever you do of uh, reading a story to your child, the way in which it's done out of tender caring 
it's like our hearts are all connected in the universe and it just keeps like it's like dropping pebbles into the water in which it all keeps spreading around and it's very hard to understand when it seems like such a trivial act how it is connected to the entire universe that way and i feel that it is important not only for the relief of suffering that you do what you can for other people it's important for your own heart that you do something the eighth goal helping to ring the bell of compassion and joy in an often bleak world landscape well when you look at the news it is so filled with crisis and pain and terror and um deceit and greed and lust i mean all you have to do is look at dynasty in dallas and things like that and you see the qualities of human beings being elevated to to fascination objects of fascination that are coming out of really the almost the least attractive qualities of humanity it's interesting almost celebrating the ugliness of humanity and um it seems to be when you get to be it's like being on the side of the angels when you begin to be an instrument of love of compassion of caring of tenderness it's as if you feel like you're you're part of the sun coming out or you're part of this beautiful these trees and the birds it's it's as if you're part of a a statement of of uh, of god's benevolence or or of the the beauty of the dance or the play of life and and the more you align yourself that way the more juice you get and the more you're capable of doing and it's catchy as mayor baba one of the spiritual beings of the past said um love is catchy it catches it goes from heart to heart it's catchy it goes from person to person this is one of my favorite goals it is possible to do good and have fun doing it we have on our um board table at the safe foundation a set of um clown eyeglasses with a big nose and if anybody uses the word serious in our board meetings uh they have to put on these glasses so that we will not take ourselves too seriously and here you, we are dealing with blindness we are dealing with incredible poverty and sickness and we're learning how to be responsible be persistent be patient do the things it's like it's like playing in the adult world and yet there are no adults present it's like uh um, it's it's remembering that life has <coughs> has a quality of game or play or dance about it and that you don't have to look serious to do good works that it can have a lightness and a playfulness and fun about it and we have a great deal of fun our board meetings we have i mean every board meeting has not only uh, meetings it has volleyball it has a uh, uh, group delights of tremendous play among it we go to fascinating places to play while we're having our board meetings the kids are always included uh it, it feels to me like we're um we're trying to find out how to do good and have fun doing it and uh wavy has been very helpful in that dimension cuz he has a delightful sense of humor and he keeps reminding us he was the fellow who ran uh, he ran the first he and the hog farm ran the first um they ran a black and white pig for president <laughs> it was the first black and white female candidate <laughs> and uh then more recently he's been running nobody for president because he says nobody can solve our economic problems and nobody really understands how to do this <laughs> you need that kind of humor to keep things a little light <laughs> The 10th and final goal that you list for the Save a Foundation is the idea that opening our love to God's love through the understanding that each of us works for all of us. When you When 
when you keep using your service as a way of working on yourself, and by what I mean is working on yourself, is by surrendering into the act itself. So there is just the act, just the brushing of the hair or the helping somebody walk or feeding somebody or raising money. Not so much that self-consciousness of look at me brushing the hair or all the big storylines about it. You're just doing it. You begin to feel yourself as part of such a vast and beautiful and harmonious way of things, what the Chinese call the Tao. You're in the way. You are in a, a perfect balance of things. And um, at that moment, you feel so connected through nature, through form, into the formless. It's as if you are, your act becomes the whisper of love with God, or it becomes the whisper of love of God. It's very interesting how, like Mother Teresa, when she's picking up the lepers in the streets of Calcutta, she says, I am dealing with Christ in all his distressing disguises. And she is seeing the beloved. Now, the people that she treats, when they say to her, why are you doing this for me? She says, because I love you so much. And they are experiencing her as the lover, as the beloved, if you will. And in a way, it's a beautiful thing. It's like God and God at play together through love and through the service. Ram Das, a lot of your work is done with dying people. Please tell us about that. Uh, I got interested in working with dying people because when you are working on yourself spiritually, the places where there is most fear or attraction become the places where you can work the most deeply to, to get yourself free. And the deepest fear for a separate individual is the fear of death. So that in almost all of the Eastern traditions, there are techniques and ways of working with dying people and working with death itself as a vehicle for spiritual awakening. For example, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is an example, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. So that um, my in initial interest in it was as a vehicle for working on myself. Now, it turns out that in the minute you have a sense that spirit is different than the body which it inhabits, and that when you die, you merely drop the body and the spirit goes on to do other parts of its adventure, then the way in which you die becomes uh, relevant to what's going to happen subsequently. And in many Eastern traditions that, that, uh, that are rooted in reincarnational ideas, this sense of the uh, where you are at the moment of death is very critical, and they use their life as a vehicle to prepare themselves for the moment of death. When I put all that together, what I saw was the possibility of centers where people who chose to voluntarily would come to die consciously. That is, they would come to use their death as a vehicle for spiritual awakening. And the people who took care of them would be people who wanted to be in the presence of death to work on their spiritual awakening. In other words, it would be a monastery or an ashram, basically, which everybody there was working on themselves spiritually. But the stuff they did together was one of them died and one of them took care of the person that was dying. And because there are no professional dyers in the business, so this was a way of bringing these groups together. This is sort of, if you look at the stepwise sequence, you go from ICU, you know, intensive care units, where the body is paramount, to the hospice movement, which is psychologically a support system, and then to this one, which is primarily a spiritual focus for consciousness. Um, and we've been experimenting with that kind of mechanism, uh, not in Seva, but in, through the Hanuman Foundation. What is your own spiritual practice? And would you please share one practice with us? Well, I, I'm uh, somewhat of a dilettante. Um, I have a lot of spiritual practices. I think my basic spiritual practices are Guru Kripa or the grace of my guru or my love of that being. It's not the being in form. He died in 73. It is the, the essence of that 
the quality of love and the quality of wisdom and the quality of compassion. I think my relation to those qualities I keep cultivating. Then another part of my practice is my service. I think I do it as karma yoga. That is, I do service as a way of getting closer to God. Because when I said to my guru, how will I get enlightened? He said, feed people. And when I said, how will I know God? He said, serve people. So that I uh, really see that my service lecturing, talking to you today, is all part of my work on myself. So you're seeing a practice in process. Then I do mantra. I do... Um, I repeat the names of God, or I have sometimes beads, things that keep reminding me to bring my consciousness back up for a moment. For example, um, what's interesting is to quiet the mind and open the heart. These are like, if you look at me, who are you seeing? Do you see a 55-year-old um, attractive gentleman? Do you see a, um, or you look at my personality and you see a friendly, nice uh, teacher, mild, manic, depressive, whatever you might see when you look at my personality. <laughs> or if you look at my astrology, you see an Aries. Or if you look a little deeply and we look into each other's eyes just like this, what you see is another being in here. And when you look and see beyond through all the veils until you and I meet right in this place behind all the forms. <clears throat> what a recognition of yourself. And it makes all of your life, your form, your body, your personality, all become the curriculum for you as a fellow soul to awaken, to recognize who you are. So you and I, as we look at each other right now, if you look right at this point between my eyes and I'm looking right at you, Actually, what I'm looking at is a camera, but I'm looking through that camera right to the point between your eyes, and we're just with each other. And you can see my face changing and all of the stuff changing around it. We just keep going in and in until we are just together in the presence of this moment, fully in the presence. Feel it. Feel the cushion you're sitting on. Feel it in the television sets in front of you. It's all right here, just the way it is. And yet, let's just quiet down around this point, this point right here. And what we're doing is we're picking a focal point. We're doing a centering and a concentration exercise. And all the thoughts that come up around it, just let them all kind of float around like little bugs around a light and keep coming back to this point right here, this centered point. And see all of this around, my face, all of it, and just keep coming back to the point. We're now experiencing the method itself. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> you have written a lot of books. Do you have any plans for another? I'm working with a uh, woman named Tara Bennett Goldman on a book called The Wisdom of Aging at the moment. Um, it's what I notice is that the myths in our culture are such that as people age, they feel like they're losing something instead of evolving. And many of us that have become familiar with other cultures where there is the extended family and where there is a role for the grandparents and where old people are not put into separate ghettos, if you will, the way we do that, um, where our mobility has cost us something dearly. And Aging is also a tremendous opportunity for dealing. It's like, like one of the greatest arts of living is to learn how to age in a way that you don't feel depleted by. For example, when I meditate, I sit quietly and I withdraw my awareness from my ears hearing, my eyes seeing, and I don't move around much. I sit quietly and I go deep inside. What happens when you get old? You lose your hearing, you lose your sight, you can't move around very much. What an ideal time for doing inner work. And yet in our culture, it's such an externalized uh, value system that unless you're playing shuffleboard and you're trying to feel young, you feel like you're missing life. And yet aging has its own beauty and its own, it's a beautiful stage for doing inner work when you've finished a lot of the stuff out in the world. And you have a chance to not be so dependent on social approval. You can be a little more eccentric. 
you can be uh, more alone without, and you can examine loneliness and boredom and all those things instead of being afraid of them all the time. There is such a, a, an art and a possibility about aging. I just, uh, now that I finish working with dying, I'm going back to aging and then pretty soon I'll get back to babies if I go <laughs> live longer. Okay. Ramdas, I would like to thank you very much for sharing yourself with us today, the information, the wisdom, the enlightenment. Thank you. It's fun to be journeying together, isn't it? Yeah, it sure yeah. is.